Hello everyone, bring you a video today looking at something in a little more detail which has actually been covered on the channel already, one of the previous videos looking at Soviet threats at the bunker at Hack Green, one of the Cold War living history events there. This is a look at the second iteration of the Home Guard which came about in the 1950s during Churchill's second term in office, basically being formed in 1952 and then wound up in 1957 under the Home Guard Act 1951, but recruitment did not begin until 1952. This was essentially to meet a perceived threat of Soviet invasion of the United Kingdom, which was a bit far-fetched at the time, although there was a, a genuine fear. Those with a little bit more analytical skill realised that this was not going to be a, a, a problem, this wasn't going to happen. Um, the idea was that the Soviets might drop large numbers of parachute troops in a similar manner to the fear of German parachute troops during the Second World War. The fear and the type of invasion w was very similar. Um, they thought there might be a nuclear bombardment ahead of time, and then Soviet troops might drop in uh, on areas which had been softened up using uh, nuclear weapons. This was far-fetched and was seen to be at the time, but it, that didn't stop the formation the re or the, the reformation of the Home Guard uh, to meet this threat. And the, the weapons and equipment are obviously very different from those which were used during the Second World War, basically the standard for the 1950s, very similar to what the British Army was using at the time, with a couple of exceptions, as we'll see as we get into the main part of the video now and have a look at this recreation. So as you can see, the basic uniform here doesn't really differ that much from the British Army at the time, although perhaps Mark II helmet would give the game away, the British Army of course wearing the Mark IV by this point. But as usual, we'll start with the weapon carried, and that is the rifle number no. 4, which through the 1950s would obviously eventually be replaced by the, the SLR, or begin to be replaced by the, the L1A1 self-loading rifle. But for the Home Guard, this would remain the standard rifle throughout and they still made use of the Sten as well, but the weapon carried here is the rifle number no. 4, as you can see. As already mentioned, headgear consists of the Mark II steel helmet. This is essentially in its last form, with all the later features, including the Mark III elasticated chin strap, which is of course more closely associated with the Mark III steel helmet, but used here with the Mark II. Basic uniform consists of the British Army's 1949 pattern battle dress, although earlier patterns were also used in some instances, but 1949 pattern is worn here, both the blouse and trousers from that suit, and as you can see, worn with a wool shirt and tie. Metal ribbons from Second World War service are worn on the left breast, and these consist of the ribbon for the Defence Medal and the 3945 War Medal. I'm normally averse to wearing medal ribbons to which you're not entitled, but these are original to the uniform, so I do not wish to remove them. Insignia consists of Home Guard shoulder titles, which as you can see in comparison to Second World War examples, which were white on khaki or white on drab, these are white on red. But in common with Second World War Home Guard titles, they are sewn on about an inch down from the shoulder seam of the battle dress as opposed to close up to it, as would be the case in the British Army proper. Below these you have the battalion title, which is the 1st Essex Battalion, as you can see. These are quite an unusual design, peculiar to the Home Guard of this time period, and they're actually made of flock on a sort of plastic backing. Quite an unusual design in that regard. The web equipment consists of a stripped down set of 1937 pattern, and this consists of the belt and basic pouches at the front. These are both Mark II examples. As you can see, the basic pouches are relatively lightly loaded with the right hand pouch containing a bandolier of 303 ammunition for the rifle. Round on the hip, we have the bayonet for the number four rifle carried in a bayonet frog, as you can see here, which is an example with the hole worked into the upper loop to allow the number four bayonet to be carried effectively. And looking to the rear, the haversack is carried on the back. As with the basic pouches, the haversack is very lightly loaded, which is referenced from period photographs of Home Guard in training, containing a set of mess tins and very little else really, just a small amount of soft kit, perhaps the cardigan and the cap comforter. A feature here which has been mentioned in previous videos of other recreations is the fact that the belt is not supported using braces, as you can see. The basic pouches are supported by the L-straps of the haversack, and that aren't supported in any other way, so there are no braces worn with this set. It's just the pouches, belt, haversack, L-straps, and the bayonet frog. Footwear consists of the standard issue ankle boots of the time, which is the redoubtable GS or ammo boot, hobnailed and made in pebble grain leather, as you can see here. And these are worn with the anklets associated with the 1937 pattern web equipment. 
So very similar to the British Army's kit and equipment of this time, there were large stocks of this available, of course, this being the National Service era, so battle dress was readily available, and 1937 pattern had been made in huge amounts, you know, huge stocks of 1937 pattern available due to the production during the Second World War. And it had gone back into production around this time as well, so there were large stocks of 1937 pattern available, so there was no problem in equipping the Home Guard with essentially the same equipment as the British Army was using at the time in the 1950s. So definitely an interesting little bit of Cold War history there, the, the reformation of the Home Guard in the 1950s. Not known to many people, but as I say, this is one of these little quirks of the Cold War and, and shows some of the paranoia that was going on at the time regarding uh, Soviet intentions. Uh, and there's no denying that certainly uh, in the early 50s, obviously in the wake of Korea and so forth, there was a serious thought that the Soviets had a very expansionist uh, aim in Europe as well as around the rest of the world. Of course, the, the domino theory in Southeast Asia was a major thing at the time. And the France were, of course, fighting the uh, the Indochina War. And yes, it was it was a time of, of great fear of Soviet intentions. And much as the, uh, the idea of a Soviet invasion of the United Kingdom at the time by parachute troops, etc., was far-fetched as we look back at it now, and was viewed by, as being far-fetched by many uh, senior military commanders and, and various other authorities at the time, it held enough sway that uh, the Home Guard was reformed. I think there was also an intent to recapture some of the wartime spirit in Britain as well and try and boost morale in that way. Uh, and probably it was also used as a little bit of a, a, a you know, the old boys club by uh, Home Guard and, and other officers who'd served during the war who might not be in the army anymore but could still play at being soldiers without being reservists in the, in the traditional sense, I suppose you could say. I think that's, it certainly served that purpose as well. Anyway, I hope you found it interesting looking at this. If you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the little notification button down below, and that will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And a huge thank you, as ever, to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated, as I always say. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to make contact but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.